Welcome to Good Dog Nation, the weekly video podcast that's all about having a good dog. Hosted by Kim Merritt, co-founder of GoodDogInABox.com and GoodDogPro.com and founder of The URL Doctor. This episode is brought to you by GoodDogInABox.com, reward-based dog training and dog bite prevention products for families with kids and dogs, and GoodDogPro.com, the online content subscription and community for dog professionals with reward-based dog training products, curriculums, and online courses to educate, motivate, and positively impact those that work with dogs. Now, let's join Good Dog Nation. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Good Dog Nation. I am Kim Merritt, co-founder of Good Dog in a Box and Good Dog Pro, and I am here today with my very special guest and good friend, Gila Kurtz of Dog is Good. Hey, Gila, how are you? Good. Thank you so much, Kim, for having me. Thank you for coming. So our subject today is one that everybody loves, puppies. Who does not love puppies? Puppies are wonderful, but puppies are a heck of a lot of work. And boy, can they totally mess up your life. So Gail and I are going to talk about all things puppy today. But before we get started, I want to read you Gila's bio because uh, she is just an incredible an incredible business person, an incredible dog trainer from way, way back. So Gila Kurtz is a serial entrepreneur who found her deepest passion is working with dogs and their people. She is the co-founder and co-owner of Dog is Good, a lifestyle brand for dog lovers. The company creates original messaging and design for a broad array of products to celebrate and share the unique joy one feels living life with a dog. But she is first and foremost, a reward-based dog trainer who loves puppies. Gila learned she really liked dogs and decided to pursue a career as a dog trainer more than 20 years ago. She immersed herself in science of canine behavior and quickly became the go-to dog trainer wherever she lived, which was quite a lot of places (laughs) following her husband around in the military. Gila strongly believes in setting a healthy, solid foundation in puppies, allows them to grow and develop into well-behaved dogs and members of the family. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Awesome. So Gila, you know, let's start with with your background and, and how you got into dog training, mm-hmm. first of all, and, and your specialty of puppies. Yeah. So, uh, well, first of all, thanks, Kim, for this opportunity to talk about this, because it is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. <laughs> um, you know, when you mentioned early on uh, being a serial entrepreneur, very true there. And my route to puppy trainer, dog trainer was kind of um, not really, it wasn't something that was planned. At the time I was operating a gourmet coffee vending business in the Washington DC area. (laughs) It was really successful business. Um, But what, and what was fun about it is I got to uh, go on a route and I would take my Dalmatian with me uh, on the route because at the very last stop, there was a dog park. This was in Alexandria, Virginia. And I remember one day walking into that dog park and there was this man with about six dogs. And I thought, God, I've never seen anybody with so many dogs. And so I asked him like, how your house must be crazy. And he's like, oh no, I'm a professional dog walker. And I I had never heard of that. This is over 20 years ago already. And I thought, well, that is a career I want to have, especially if he was sharing how much money he made. Um, but when we moved from the DC area to rural Panama City Beach, Florida, dog walking was not a needed profession. And I realized very quickly that if I wanted to do something that was fun, that was rewarding, um, and in alignment with just things that I valued, that I could go into training dogs and their people. Because prior, my whole professional life experience started as a high school teacher. So if I could, I was able to combine, I saw the opportunity to combine those two loves of dogs and people to teach. And that's how I became a a trainer. That's where it started. So Mm -hmm. how did you decide to focus in on puppies? Yes. So over the years, I've always focused on uh, just the core basic manners. I would hold puppy classes. I would also work with families um, and their their adult dogs or adolescent dogs, et cetera, rescue dogs, any any dog, exactly. But uh, in the past 12 years, as we launched the Dog is Good brand, uh, the Dog is Good company took off pretty quickly. And so I found myself training less and less and less because I didn't have the time availability. But the one area that I would always maintain 
was work with puppies and their people because I just felt so strongly about the importance of getting off on the right start and really educating these families so that those puppies stayed with those families for the remainder of their lives. And then I quickly found that in working with puppies and their families, that was also my stress relief. That was just like a fun outlet that I noticed whenever I was uh, teaching and helping them, I was in a, a space that really served my soul and re-energized me and kept me excited. And I decided, you know, in anything, it's great when you can niche down and when you can niche down into an area that you love, where you see value um, and, and that is something that's important. That, that, that's how I decided to just really focus only on that. There's trainers who can do all the other stuff, but I am an expert at puppy development and an expert at uh, helping families and in, uh, in my ability to communicate with them what to expect and how to handle the different changes that are occurring from week to week. So let's talk about that mm -hmm. for everybody out there, particularly with the holidays coming up, because there's a lot of people that are going to get a puppy mm. for Christmas, which <laughs> is, is not necessarily the best time or the best idea, but we're still going to have a lot of people out there who are going to get puppies for the holidays. So let's talk about what should a family, particularly one with children, expect with a puppy coming into the house? Well, uh, particularly during the holiday season, this is going to be a really chaotic time, of course. And, you know, the fact of the matter is whether we like it or not, a lot of families are going to choose to do that, uh, get that right at Christmas time. What makes it challenging is the chaos of, of those two weeks when the kids are home and out of school, right? They're there, there's family, there's a lot of activities going on. And while right. they're technically there and we think, oh, this might be a great time, uh, usually the mom... Uh, is the one that ends up taking all the responsibility, right? And she's got a lot on her plate already. Um, the main thing to remember, and this is no different whether it's Christmas time, holiday season, or any other time during the year. Right. When a puppy leaves its litter and comes into the home for the first time, it's a stressful experience for the pup. And I think one of the most important things that I want people to understand is what the world is like from their puppy's perspective. Right. And so right. understanding that departing um, their mom, the, their litter mates, the family and environment that they've known since they were born, having that change can be very stressful. And so with everybody in the house wanting to play with the puppy and the puppy's so cute and all the family wants to see it and friends are coming over, et cetera, um, it can be incredibly overwhelming. And so they need to be cognizant not only of that, but really be intentional about how they're going to structure that period when they're first bringing the puppy home and those initial days after all the excitement of Christmas and how they're handling potential travel. I've had situations where the people did get a puppy and they had it for the week. And then the last week between Chris, between New Year's and, um, excuse me, Christmas and New Year's, they were traveling and needed to do something with the puppy. So, you know, families really need to be intentional about what is going to take place during those two weeks. And also in, in any time period during the year, what, are those first two weeks going to be like as you integrate this new, adorable, sweet thing that's going to be with you ideally the rest of its life? Um, what are those, what is each day going to look like? I'm really very, very specific about asking that question to all the people that I work with. What does success look like to you? It's fun and it's exciting to bring a puppy in, but A, let's help you understand what you're going to see from a week to week and how are you going to um, help that puppy assimilate into this new lifestyle that it's going to have right and this is not something that necessarily happens overnight it's a lot <laughs> right. of work and it, it's funny i i mean i've even had professional dog trainers who have said to me you know, I work with dogs all the time. I hadn't had a puppy in 10 or 15 years, got a puppy. Oh my gosh, I forgot how much work. And I'm with dogs all the time. Forgot yeah. how much work these these lovely little critters it, are. It is. It's a lot of work. And it can be lot incredibly stressful. What what are what do you suggest to your clients and your families before they even bring that dog home? Mm. What do they want to have in their house? So uh, my favorite is when a family will call me before they actually get their pup. That would be the ideal time to bring me in. 
But for those who don't, the, you know, the most important thing is having a very specific area that is going to be designated for the puppy. By all means, puppies should not have free reign of the entire household. And if they can remember, if a family can remember that the tighter the boundaries initially, the easier it is to expand upon those as the puppy matures and is capable of handling expanded freedom. It's much harder to rein the puppy in <laughs> once you've extended the boundaries too, too long. Um, but the basics, I mean, the obvious things, I say obvious, may not be so obvious to everybody, but the basics would include uh, a crate, uh, a place where that puppy is going to have its, you know, a safe space. It's a place where it can go settle, uh, be safe and uh, spend the evening. And it's also uh, a tool that is going to be used to manage the house training process. Uh, secondly, the bowls um, and for food and for, for water, uh, a variety of toys, a variety of appropriate chews. And I say that word intentionally, <laughs> appropriate chews. Um, the collar and the leash, which they don't need to put on the first day the puppy's there, but they should have that available. Uh, they should have designated where that puppy's going to eat. They should know exactly where that puppy needs to um, use, go potty, you know, outside. Right. Um, they should have that all systemized and systematized. And um, those are the basics that they, that they need to, um, to uh, have. But the other thing that they need to be prepared for, which people don't often think about, is they need to answer that question. How does, what does success look like to you? So everybody is pretty clear on what they identify as a, a let's, I hate using these labels, but we're just going to call it a good dog and a bad dog, right? Um, if you take the time to really think through what are those behaviors that make up a good dog, Typically, a person would list a whole list of things that we would define as obedience cues or training cues, sit, down, stay, can come when called, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the bad dog label typically is given to the behaviors like jumping and barking and soiling the house and um, pulling on a leash and biting, digging, uh, all of these things that when you think about it, is the instinctual, or excuse me, are the instinctual behaviors that this beautiful puppy came to you with. <laughs> that is the essence of who they are. And so, you know, when we're bringing dogs into the home, uh, we are in essence uh, striving to de-dog them. We want them to become well-mannered by our standards. And so if they have an idea of what that looks like to them, meaning um, where is that dog going to be allowed to, to be? Is it going to be allowed on a couch or on a, you know, someone's bed, et cetera? How do they envision this dog uh, when people come to the front door or when they're cooking in the kitchen or if the kids have friends over? When they can begin to, to envision what life is like a year from now, from that time that puppy first comes in, they can begin to set up a training protocol that meets those standards. But they have to have clarity around that to begin with. And then combined right. with that clarity, they really need to uh, make it a priority to understand what the world is like from that puppy's perspective and how that puppy learns and uh, how that puppy develops. Because those three things will allow for that human to have a little bit more empathy. And um, excuse me, I'll turn that off one sec. It allow the puppy. It allow the person to have more empathy as they're working with their puppy, and be a better teacher to guide them along in the process. What does a, a new pet parent want to do with that puppy in the first twenty four hours versus the first week? What What are the first yeah. things they want to concentrate on? Quite honestly, the first thing that they want to do is really just create a relaxing environment for the pup. Just allow that puppy to just kind of take it all in. And really, you know, that's the time to begin that bonding and love process. We, while training, I believe, is happening 100% of the time, meaning the dog is picking up, um, right. getting feedback constantly. Um, it is that first 24 hours, you don't need to dive right into the training. You just need to provide a safe place for the dog. Uh, you want to bond and you just want to enjoy it and um, and then get into the to the real work once the week gets underway. 
Absolutely. So uh, want to ask you, take it kind of back a little bit and get uh, some feedback from you, some comments on you on the importance of knowing where your puppy comes from. What what do you look for when you pick a puppy as far as, you know, and we've got shelters versus breeders. So there's mm -hmm. there's that back and forth. But what do you actually look for in a puppy making sure it's right for you and your family? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the most important starting point is to identify what is the family's lifestyle like? Um, is Are they super active on the go? Are they traveling? Do, are they going to want to be able to, uh, like I live near the shore, so do you want to be able to take your dog to Dog Beach and have fun there? Um, or are you, um, you know, at, at a stage in your life where you're not as active and walking around the block is a great you know, form of exercise, but you're not ready to hike mountains or take a five mile run kind of thing. So knowing what your lifestyle is first and foremost, and then doing your research on the breed types that begin to that fit into uh, some of those characteristics. And there are some great tools online for families to use as a resource to help narrow down the, uh, the uh, right, right breed for them. Uh, but then the question becomes, where do you get this dog? So there is that decision to be made. If you want a purebred dog, I've had two rescues and two purebreds. Um, my purebred Labrador retriever, um, Bolo, who is sleeping under my feet right now, um, came to us uh, not from a breeder, but I, she was, um, I was the puppy raiser for her for the uh, guide dog program. And she didn't make it all the way through the program, so she got came back to me. Um, our other dog was a Japanese chin and he, well, not was, he still is. He is a Japanese chin. And uh, so that came from a, a breeder, a reputable breeder that we researched for a long time before making that selection. But the other two were rescues that we just got from a, um, the shelter. And again, uh, in going to a rescue or shelter, which, you know, it to me is such a wonderful thing to do, uh, there's so many dogs that just are seeking a forever home. And sometimes you may find that you are you may not really want a puppy. Maybe you want a little bit older dog. Right. And in going to the shelters, you might find something that's that's better for you. But in ascertaining what is going to be the best um, option, if it is going the breeder route, uh, really establishing with the breeder what your lifestyle is. And if you have kids, if you're older, because they can help you, they can work in partnership with you to, to find the right pup from a litter, you know, based on the personality types and where they're falling out in that um, hierarchy in the, in the litter. And if it's at a shelter or a rescue group, again, hopefully the staff can begin to help, but you can, there's, uh, you know, ways to, to uh, look at the general temperament of a dog to, again, determine what's going to be in best alignment for you and your lifestyle and the amount of time that you have to devote to this dog. So what do you say to families about getting everybody on the same page mm -hmm. with a new puppy? Yep. So that goes right back to that question. It is an exercise I put them through. What does success look like to you? Who's the head trainer? I always ask the family, who's the head trainer? <laughs> Always mom. Um, Always mom. Right. But uh, so there, I like to see that there is one head trainer and then the assistants. That's kind of how I talk about it when I'm dealing with kids or the spouse, et cetera. Um, because we want to have one person that is just at least doing the teaching part. And then the others are facilitating uh, and reinforcing what that puppy is learning and that they're all on the same page in terms of how it's being done. And, uh, and making sure that they're rewarding the right things. And it's so important for everybody to be on the same page with that training. You can't have four different people in the house all saying and doing different things to get that puppy to do the, the exact same thing. They mm -hmm. all have to be, it has to be consistent and it has to be uh, the, the same thing. So definitely I, I love your, mm -hmm. your, uh, and you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it's fun too. Uh, if it's a, if it's a family, if people, if there's the head trainer, let's say, and then there's the, um, the department heads, if you want to call them that. So you have family members assigned to particular behaviors. So you're in charge of oh. mastering this one. And then if, you know, when kids are involved, then it can be kind of, 
can become fun, like almost like a contest or a game where they're they are focused on this is their man, they're going to nail this one and really help that puppy to master this particular thing. Um, as if I mean, that works great if you have a if you have a family, if you're just a, a you know, one person or maybe a couple with with a puppy. Again, the two of you can um, can work together, but it is important to do it uh, the same way. I mean, it can be very confusing for the puppy. That's a great idea. Um, talk to us about why reward-based training is so important, particularly with puppies, and why we want to make sure that whatever we're doing is reward-based. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, my philosophy has always been do no harm. Just do no harm. I mean, the again, when you understand that we are putting expectations on these creatures to completely shift from who they came into this world to be, you know, the general uh, instinctive natural behaviors of what it is to be a dog. And we're trying to strip them of that because it doesn't coincide with um, being well-mannered in our, you know, homes or outside of the homes. Um, have, you really have to be clear on clear on that. And um, I think reward-based training often uh, is referred, many people confuse that with always meaning you're giving them a piece of food, Okay. And yes. what I want to be clear with is that positive reinforcement means you are just providing something pleasant that reinforces the very behavior that you want to accomplish, that you want to see. And that can be any number of things. And really, quite honestly, the animal gets to decide what is reinforcing. For many, it is food. For others, it might be a ball. For all, it's the opportunity to receive love and praise and attention, um, all of these things. But you are going to um, foster a stronger bond, build greater trust, and have a relationship that's founded on mutual respect when you are using uh, methodologies that uh, are founded in tr truly animal science learning and uh, will solidify those behaviors. Well, and just common sense. How do you learn? Do you mm -hmm. learn better when somebody is is kind and offers suggestions and constructive criticism or when somebody yells at you and, and calls you stupid no. or, or, or something derogatory? Yeah. I mean, there you go. It's so true. And I love that you brought that up because it is very true. And then the other thing, when I, as I mentioned, the dog always gets to decide the reinforcer. One of the analogies I like to use is, um, you know, my, my daughter, um, she loves chocolate. So let's say I were to offer her a box of chocolate to empty the dishwasher. Okay. So one day maybe she'd be like, yeah, sure. I'll take that Godiva and empty your dishwasher for you. <laughs> but what if she had just pigged out upstairs in her room on a box of chocolates and came down and I said, Hey, I want you to empty the dishwasher. I'll give you chocolate. She's not going to, she might be like, Ugh, I feel sick. I don't want any chocolate. So you have to be, you have to understand as the, as your puppy's, um, teacher, if you will, that you have to have a variety of tools that you can pull out of your toolbox. Uh, depending on the situation and depending on what distractions are available to them exactly. that may uh, make your original reinforcement uh, no longer valid. Well, and just a, a perfect segue into talking about what we did together, which I'm so excited about. So my company, Good Dog in a Box, got together with Gila and her company, Dog is Good. And Gila was so sweet to give her 20 plus years of reward based training and offered it up to us. And what we did was we created a online reward based puppy training course, Puppy 101, uh, that takes somebody who is ready to bring a new puppy home through really the first two weeks plus on what they're yeah. going to do with that puppy, the management of how to set up your lifestyle and the lifestyle of that puppy down to the exact exercises and different reward based trainings that you're going to want to do. And I want to show if we can take, I think about a minute and a half, let's show yeah. one of the videos. Awesome. Um, this is on targeting. So let's, let's watch Gila in, uh, in action. Okay, today we're going to focus on targeting behavior. Targeting is when your puppy will put their nose directly into the palm of your hand. And you might be thinking, what am I going to do with that? Targeting has a lot of uses. Once your puppy knows how to touch, you can direct their movement 
anywhere. As they're coming to you, you can provide a directive on where they're supposed to go. If you're trying to prevent jumping, you can teach a dog to target the lower area of a leg so they're not jumping up. When you're walking, you can help the dog stay from pulling on leash by directing them that way. And then down the road, when you're ready to do all sorts of fun tricks and advanced work, targeting really comes into play. Now, the way that we teach it is just by simply presenting our palm flat down, or you can do a fist. I prefer to do my palm. And the moment the puppy's nose touches it, you're gonna say yes. And then little by little, we'll gradually move it around until the puppy figures out, oh, it's when I put my nose into your palm that I actually get the treat. We'll also name the cue as we're moving this along. So we're gonna get started. Okay, Archie. Good boy. Watch. Remember, the puppy must be looking at you. Yes. Good. Whoops. There you go. Archie. Yes. Good boy. One more. Watch. Touch. Yes, good boy, and you're done. Okay, remember not to repeat the cue. It's really important for them to see that nothing's happening, just like you notice nothing's happening. They will try the behavior in order to figure out what they need to do next. And Archie kind of began to figure that out. We'll do more a little um, on another uh, training session. We always want to keep our training sessions short because their attention span is short and we don't want to wear them out. We want to keep it fun. <laughs> we had so much fun filming that. Yeah. Particularly with dear sweet Archie. Little he was, Archie. We, yeah. We had such a good time. But uh yeah, just uh, I'm I'm so happy with the finished product that we got out of that gala. Yeah, you did a great job um filming that and thank you for all your patience because I know we had to do a lot of stops and starts <laughs> at my office, but um now that was fun. And for anybody who's watching now new, you know, the cool thing about targeting behavior is it really does, it does play into future advanced work where the dog, you can send it off to target any number of things. It's a great parlay into treat into a tricks as well. But at the end of the day, it's one of my favorite foundation skills. Um, it Absolutely. It really is. Well, and the course that you made with us is filled with all those types of, of reward-based training basic skills along with, again, a lot of great management and um, uh, how to's for a new pet parent who maybe either hasn't had a puppy ever before or hasn't had one in a long time. Scheduling and everything from potties to socialization, how important it is to get that puppy mm -hmm. out. So, uh, you know, available on gooddoginabox.com. It was just released. And we're, again, just thrilled to have Gila as, as part of that program. So if you're getting a puppy for, for <laughs> Christmas, what well, we always say, or anytime, don't forget the training yes. when that puppy comes to your house. Gila, what does somebody want to look for in a trainer? Because we've got this great online mm -hmm. video class, but that still doesn't necessarily replace a trainer um, and puppy class to actually get your your puppy in front and and mixing with other puppies. What suggestions do you have? That's a great question. I think you know one of the most important things that they need to make sure is that that trainer is qualified. That it's not a, a hobby or just somebody who likes dogs who trained their own dogs and had some success there, um, or trained the neighbor's dog too. You know, somebody who truly has um, spent the time in. Uh, fostering their own education and in continuing education as well, um, because things are always, there's always new things to learn and grow, uh, grow with, within this field. So that would be the first thing. The second thing I think is very important is, do you relate to that person, right? And what I mean by that is, um, are, are you comfortable and uh, it, in how they are teaching you? Are they able to communicate the lessons uh, succinctly and provide you with the, the right coaching to make it all work? And are they available to you uh, outside of your 
lesson. And, and when I say available, myself, I always tell my clients, look, when you're right in a bind, right in that moment, you do not need to wait until you see me the following week. Just, just send me a quick text and I'll address it quickly. If it's something that uh, requires a lengthy response, um, I can have, I already have resources that I could send them if it requires something in that nature. But I think uh, background education, knowledge, experience, ability to communicate and the ability to make it fun because it, it is stressful for the person. It, they're trying to yes. figure it out. And the trainer knows what to do. We've been doing it for so long. It's second nature. But when we get into a, uh, that space of over telling the person what's going on or what they need to be doing, um, we can lose them. And we, we as why we want our um, customers or clients to be cognizant of what's going on with the puppy, we as the trainer need to be cognizant and aware of what's going on with that person who's trying to figure it out. Because it's it's not necessarily easy for everybody. It isn't second nature for everybody. Right. A lot of things are common sense, but in the moment when you've got kids running around yeah. and this puppy's going cr and just the everyday buzz of life going on, sometimes the obvious isn't obvious. That's right. So it just really helps to have a professional to be your guide through the process. And puppy class is extremely important because socialization, we've got to get, talk about socialization just for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. My fave, um, favorite in that. I know there's so much conflicting information that those people are going to receive um, from, from different sources. So proper and safe socialization is critical. And the people really, the people really do have a short window of opportunity to take advantage of this prime moment to really help that puppy become a behaviorally sound dog in every situation. The common uh, definition of socialization for most people, un, you know, not train trainers, but the average person, is that it means uh, the opportunity to play and interact with other dogs. That is one small piece of it. Socialization, if, they, if people can think of it this way, is the opportunity to experience the world as they're going to experience it and have um, a positive uh, and, and do so in a positive way. So that means exposure to different sights, different sounds, different textures that they can walk on, uh, different types of people, uh, adults and elderly, um, a you know, people wearing uniforms. There's you know, a whole list of things that they should be doing. But we just want the puppy to have um, small interactions over the course of these several weeks with all these different things and have uh, it done so in a, in a way that leaves them with a positive experience. Now, the interaction with other dogs is, is fine. Obviously, we want to make sure that they're um, safe dogs, uh, both in terms of vaccination and temperament. And um, but that's it. And, and people can do this safely. When you have a puppy, for the most part, at least early on, even with the bigger breeds, you can hold the puppy. You can right. be out in your front yard and that dog can experience sights, sounds, et cetera. Um, where I live in uh, Seal Beach, California, when I was doing puppy training full time before Dog is Good was developed, part of my training was to take the pup down to, to Main Street. I would sit and have a cup of coffee. I brought a mat so the puppy wasn't on the ground. Uh, it was able, everybody, of course, wanted to say hi. They had exposure to all different sights and sounds. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about socialization, the chance to experience the world that they're going to live in. Um, and you can do so safely. You can do so safely before your puppy has its entire vaccination yes, run. Exactly. So, don't want to be taking it to the dog park, but you can take it to yeah, places. Yeah, I'm where... glad you mentioned that. There's the dog park and dog beach. If you're fortunate to live by a dog beach, those are not the places to take your puppy during this time period before full vaccination. Um, but there's plenty of other places you can go. Absolutely. Gila, thank you so mm -hmm. much for joining us today and sharing all this great information to everybody who's thinking about a puppy or has a brand new puppy. What a wonderful experience it is for you. Just remember patients and their babies <laughs> and you'll have a wonderful time. Thank yeah. you so much and we'll see you all next week. If you'd like to participate in the rest of today's conversation for professionals who work with dogs and receive continuing education credits from participating organizations for listening, 
visit gooddogpro.com and subscribe today. Use coupon PODCAST to get 40% off your first month or annual subscription.